Good evening. Trust everyone is well. We've had an incredible, well, it's been three days now. We started the missions conference on Friday, and we just had all sorts of people coming in from all over and got an opportunity to see how God is so working around the world. And, you know, and I think about our fellowship. I think about here at Spring Valley and how God has taken this church from from the handful of people that we were some 25 years ago plus, and then taken that group of people. And now when I listen to the testimonies of the different missionaries and the different pastors over these past few days about the work that is going on, I realize how much God has woven us through the fabric of all of that work. And what was simply a few things that we were doing in the beginning, now we're seeing work being accomplished all over the world. And, and I'm mindful of even something I mentioned this morning, that it was, it was some, well, it's, it's getting closer to 27, 28 years ago. I, when, the, when this church began, we were just a handful of people in a daycare center. And, and, of course, the kids thought it was great because they thought the daycare center was a church built for them because the water fountain was only this high off the ground and the you know, and all the things that go along in a daycare center. And, and yet we watched from that moving into a, into a storefront. And we were so poor in those days that, that, that we didn't even have enough money for air conditioning. We went our first summer in a strip mall in a storefront without air conditioning. We didn't have carpet on the floor, and we had a bunch of awful colored chairs. They were these bright burnt orange chairs with chrome rims on them that we happened to get from the bingo palace. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is just incredible when you think about this. And matter of fact, there's still a few of those old chairs around here. We've kept them as relics, you know, to, to make sure that we are mindful of those days. But I can remember a Sunday morning just asking the congregation, do you really believe that Jesus can take a storefront church and turn the world upside down? And you know, they said yes, and yes. And you know what happened from that? It went from reaching out across our own land to we started with building printing facilities in Southeast Asia. We built the first radio station in the South Pacific. We, I mean, things that were just not even feasible for a for a church to even consider uh, doing. And, and I can remember when we were putting that radio station together, we didn't know a thing about building radio stations and how you do it. All I know is that somehow through God's providence, I was able to speak at a prayer breakfast for the king of Tonga. And, and, and he asked after that day, he invited us back to his palace for his birthday party and he said to me he says what can we do for you and I said well we have some real friend dear friends that want to start radio in the south pacific here and we need a license and he gave us a license to build a radio station and <laughs> and we built the transmitter here in Las Vegas and we didn't know anything about transmitters and we didn't know how much trouble you could get into by going on the air and not tell the FCC <laughs> But we needed to make sure it worked before we took it, and and we we had just moved into this building, and and we put the antenna up on the roof here, and we had people scattered all over the city, uh, standing by payphones, and said, "Now we only can stay online for a few minutes because we'll get in trouble if anybody hears us." And so we fired up the radio station at 93 FM. And everybody was sitting by on their, at, their, at these phone booths all over the city. And as soon as, they, as soon as we started transmitting, they all started dialing in and says, hey, we can hear you, we can hear you. And so we took that, that old transmitter and the things we had to Tonga, and we, we didn't even have a tower to put the antenna up on. And we had a, a Fijian that was with us, and he... He was part monkey. He climbed all the way to the top of this mango tree, 90 feet in the air. And we hung the antenna off of this mango tree. 
and we didn't have any place to put the equipment, so we, we had this old rusted uh, Land Rover that we pushed over under the tree. We, we fondly named it the first station wagon, but we, <laughs> we, we, we put the transmitter and everything inside that old beat up Land Rover, and we started broadcasting on 93 FM in the Kingdom of Tonga. And you know, here it is, 20 years later, and that radio station is still broadcasting. Of course, they're no longer hanging from a mango tree, and it's no longer a rusted out station wagon. But, uh, but it, it's it, when I have these missions conferences here, and we come and we do these things, there's that opportunity to reflect back on what God will do with a group of people if they say, we're willing, Lord, just show us. Just show us and we'll go and we'll do that. And, 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 it's, and it's one of those things that it becomes infectious. It's, it's contagious. Once you start to, to see how God wants to be able to use you and, and, and reach out around the world, then it, then it never ends. We, we went from one thing to the next thing and, and then I'm here on Saturday listening to the different folks share and they're talking about how when they were part of this fellowship, God had stirred in their hearts certain things and now we see churches being planted all over the world. We got churches being planted in Mozambique. We got people churches being planted in different parts of Asia and Central and South America and, you know, all from a group of people that says, yes, we believe Jesus can turn the world upside down. You know, it's one interesting thing that God taught me a long time ago, that we're not going to win the world with an army the size of David's. We're going to win the world with an army the size of Gideon's. And he has been faithful to that over and over again. It never seems to amaze me what God is willing to do and how he's able to accomplish it. Tonight, I want to be able to continue talking about missionaries, but I want to talk to you about a reluctant missionary. So we're going to be in the Old Testament tonight, so if you don't have a Bible with you, if you would raise your hands, we'll make sure that you get one, and you can turn to the book of Jonah the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of those little books in the Old Testament. If you can't find it, and somebody else has already found it, just grab their Bible, give them yours, let them do the work. In case you can't find it, it's right next to Obadiah. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much for this fellowship. Lord, I thank you for the way that you've continued to use it. And, and Lord, to realize that we've all had a small part in it. And, and yet, all the little small parts, those are the things that build the big things. And Jesus, you've, you've let us see your glory over and over again. So tonight, Jesus, as we, as we spend some time in your word, speak to our hearts, stir our minds, allow for us to grow in a way that you want us to grow. And I thank you, Jesus, for, for the way that you continue to love us. And it's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. You know, one of the things I'm so thankful for with Spring Valley that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're the pastor of a church for so many years as I was here, uh, you start to wonder sometimes. You think, wow, after 27 years, or, 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 you step away from the pulpit. And, and you know, I praise God for, for Derek. De Derek has continued to carry the baton so well. You know, he loves the Lord. He loves the reaching the world. He's a young man. He, he's got all kinds of energy. He's going to be able to continue to carry the baton here for many, many years to come. And I'm so, I'm so blessed for that.
But I also think to myself that I don't always get back here as much as I'd like, even though Las Vegas is home for us. It's been home for, well, it's scary to think it's going on 40 years. And, and, but uh, that all it takes is, is, is a weekend back in the pulpit here, and I feel like I've never left. And it's a, it's a good thing. It's a fun thing. And, uh, and there's, such a, there's such a sense of, of, of coming home. But as I was looking at all the different things that we've talked about this weekend and the number of times that I have shared in different areas of Scripture, the book of Jonah is one of those books of the Bible that, well, many say is not a true story. It's allegory. It's describing a, 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 a state of mind of Israel. It's, it's it's describing a, a number of different things, but I have a tendency not to really believe that. And, and the reason I, I don't necessarily believe that, because if it was in fact just given to us as allegory, if it was just to be nothing more than a, than a, than a story that allows for us to, uh, uh, to glean some principle about God's providence, uh, I would say to that that I, I have to disagree because Jesus mentioned this story. Jesus spoke of Jonah, and, and, and I don't know that his addressing and speaking of Jonah would have been in a sense that he would do it any other way than for us to know that Jonah was a real person. And it's interesting that when we look at real people, and I want you to always be careful of this because... You know, Paul tells us in the, in the 15th chapter of the book of Romans, he says, you know, the things that are written in this book, uh, in the old King James, it said that they're a tutor. That they're, it, it's a school for us. The things that are written in this Old Testament, even though we know that we are a New Testament church, the things that we glean from the Old Testament are so important to us because they describe to us the character of the God that we serve today. And not only does it describe the character of the God that we serve today, but it gives us this incredible or these incredible insights into human behavior. Now, I don't know that anybody in this room is in any big hurry to get swallowed by a big fish. But you know, the story of Jonah allows us to understand something about, believe it or not, us here today. It's not just a great story to do in a Sunday school class with a flannel graph. Does anybody use flannel graphs anymore? Do you know what a flannel graph is? <laughs> well, you know, it used to be a real effective tool in Sunday school. And in fact, we used to use it on the mission field a lot because it was pictures and people can deal with pictures and things like that. But this is, a, this is an interesting story. It even frames it in a time period that is so meaningful to us. And so as we look at this book, let's pray. And then let's, let's talk about... Let's talk about Jonah for a while. Jesus, we need you. All of our discussions, our ability to utilize our own language, the, able, the ability to communicate and to do it in such a way that one might listen. Lord, I, all of it is for naught unless your spirit is the one that's teaching us. And so we ask, Jesus, that you would allow your spirit to be here tonight, not only as we've worshipped you, but, Lord, your spirit would be our teacher, that he would take the things that you gave us in this book that we might learn and that he might be our teacher to show us what it is that you want us to walk away from here with. And so, Lord, as we look at this little book of the Old Testament, an interesting story about a man named Jonah, we ask that you teach us. And it's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. You know, as we begin this story, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, 
the thing that I always enjoy about our understanding of the Old Testament, the Lord just didn't throw stories out there without giving us a historical time frame to work in. And the reason that I know that he does that is because the historical time frame has a way of giving us understanding of why people are behaving the way they are behaving. Amittai was a prophet. He was a prophet to Jeroboam II. That time frame gets us back about 750 B.C. It gets us back to a time frame when the, the Assyrian Empire was growing and growing. And the thing that you need to remember, that if you're a studier of history, that you realize that the Assyrians were probably some of the most brutal people on this planet. They did things to people that actually were, were, were of such great atrocities that many of our modern day pictures of, 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 of the Holocaust and a lot of these things, that some of these people from this time frame were so vicious then so, so cruel that, that it's no wonder that the world feared them. Now, when you read the story of Jonah, you would say to yourself, well, when the Lord spoke to Jonah, we can understand why Jonah behaved the way he did, because he was afraid. It says, the word of the Lord came to him, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So initially, the, initially you look at this and you think, well, uh, I can understand if, if the Lord told me right now that, that I was to go to, uh, to Tehran, if I was to buy an airline ticket and go to Tehran and walk through the city of the streets of that, the, through the streets of that city and cry out against the Iranian government and the cruelty and the things that they do, or even, let's not even pick Iran. Let's pick a, 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 a friend of this nation. Let us, let us go to Saudi Arabia. Let us, let us buy a ticket and walk through the that the cities of Saudi Arabia crying out to the people saying, God is going to destroy you because you are people who live in an environment of one human rights violation after another. You are this and you are that. You think to yourself, that's going to get me killed. And you know, people don't like to jump up into things that are going to get them killed. It's just not the, the thing to do on Saturday afternoon. But, but here's, here's the thing. Sometimes when we read a story like this, that's our natural tendency to think it was out of fear. But I think it's different here. I think this story will tell us a little bit not only about Jonah, but it'll tell us a little bit about ourselves. It says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That is in the opposite direction of Nineveh. The Lord says, go this way. He says, no way. I'm going this way. And that's what he did. He, it says to us, he went down to Joppa, which is a seaport, which is just south of the modern day Tel Aviv. It says, and found a ship going to Tarshish. Now, there's always arguments about where Tarshish is. I don't care where Tarshish is. All I know is it was in the opposite direction of Nineveh because Nineveh was inland, and he was down on there getting on a ship which was going in the opposite direction. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How Many times does the Lord tell us to do something and our natural tendency is, <laughs> not me, you have to be kidding. And, and we do everything that we can 
to try to fix it. So that's not what we do. We don't want to go in, in, in a direction that many times is so contrary to everything that we have put into place. But as we read the story, it says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo and, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. These are sailors. They, 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 they know what, what, what the sea is like. They, they know what they're getting into when they go out into a ship and they get out onto that water and this storm is coming and, and they know this, this, this ship is too heavy. We can't ride a storm like this out with this load in there. And they're doing what sailors would do naturally. They're starting to unload the cargo. But look what it says. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, had laid down and was fast asleep. Now you think, well, He's at peace with his decision. God says, go this way. He goes the other way. He's not worried. He goes down and he goes to sleep. I have a little different theory on this, and, and I'm not one of the kind that would say that to you tonight that this is a thus saith the Lord, but this is an opinion according to John Michaels. The only reason that Jonah was down in the bottom of that ship asleep is because he was in deep depression. He had reached a point where he knew he was disobedient in God's eyes, and he was doing exactly what he was not supposed to do. And the end result of that was he is a classic picture of someone that has been overcome by depression. And he finds himself down there and bouncing around in the bottom of this ship so the captain came to him and said to him, what, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. So you see, I don't think that Jonah was running up there calling out to his God because he knew his God well enough to know that, that God may fix this situation. I think that Jonah wanted to die. You know, when you're walking in disobedience of God and you've entered into that realm of depression and you are knowingly doing that that is willful in nature, you reach a place where you think, I would just be better off if I wasn't here. And I only say this from the realm of the fact that I have been ministering for many, many years and I know that depth of depression that people will walk into knowing that they're walking completely in the areas that they shouldn't be walking in and they know they say to themselves there's no way out of this thing if I could I, I, I want to die and I don't think Jonah was was paying a whole lot of attention to anything else but himself and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know who was cause of this, for, who ca for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Of course. I mean, you've got to remember that you say, well, that, you know, and that's all by chance. If you don't think God controls everything, then, then you probably don't subscribe to this thought but if you believe that God controls everything he's certainly capable of pointing out Jonah to the rest of them then they said to him please tell us for what cause is this trouble upon us and then they start the interrogation interrogation what is your occupation can't you see Jonah I ain't telling him I'm a prophet and where do you come from? Well, I'm not going to tell them where I come from. What is your country? And of what people are you? Oh, I think he was a little overwhelmed by the interrogation at that point because he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. You notice the word Lord there? All capital letters. Do you know what the convention is in the scripture when you see all capital letters like that? 
You see, in the original text, what was inserted in there was the name of the Lord, his name. But the Jew would never speak his name. And so what the Jew did is they took his name and they put it into an acronym. They made it a contraction that was unpronounceable. And so when the translators translated from the Hebrew, whenever they came to this contraction, and remember the personal name of God to the Jew was Yahweh. Well, we see it a little different rendering when we talk about the Subtuagent, which is the Old Testament that has been translated into the Greek. We see the Greek terminology Jehovah. But, this, this, but what, the, what the translators did was so that you and for me, when we read the scripture, we knew that this was talking about the personal God that we know. It was calling him by name. They always put it in all capital letters like this. And so it would read, I am a Hebrew and I fear Yahweh. And everybody knew who Yahweh was. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Well, somewhere in this interrogating process, he told them what the problem was. He says, Yahweh told me to go to Nineveh. I got on your ship because I knew you were going in the other direction. And so I don't think they were a bit too happy with him. As a matter of fact, they will eventually throw him overboard. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. Isn't it interesting? They cried out to which God? No longer crying out to their own gods any longer, are they? They're crying out to Yahweh, and they said, they said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it have done as it pleased you. Then they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. You know, here's the thing that always amazed me about that little area of Scripture. Even people who don't believe in God recognize when something is supernatural. And they watch this whole thing take place. And they heave Jonah into the water and the sea becomes calm. And where's their attention drawn? The attention's drawn to the God that just did that. And they offered sacrifice. And, they, and, 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 and the indication is that somehow these on that ship didn't get destroyed but found themselves worshiping him. But look at what it says, that the Lord, the Lord still cared for Jonah. It says, now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now, now that doesn't sound too like a whole lot of fun. Uh, you know, the, the Lord took Jonah and made him bait. <laughs> so this, this big fish, we don't know what kind of a fish it was, but it was big enough to swallow a man. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And now, of course, we won't talk about the, the, the implication of the three days and the three nights, but we know that Jesus spoke of these things, and he used Jonah as the example. But I like what the next verse says. It says, then Jonah prayed. He's about to die in a storm. 
He's running from God. He tells them what they, he did. They throw him overboard. They worship God. A big fish comes along and swallows him, and then he prays. Why do we have to wait till we get swallowed to pray? And that's what we see happening here. It says, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. <laughs> Amazing. And he answered me. Now, I don't know what it's like to be in the, fish, in the belly of a fish, but the description that's given to us here is kind of an interesting one. It says, it says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. That word Sheol is a Hebrew word that really means, well, it's used a lot in the Old Testament to mean grave. But it's even a little deeper than that. You see, the belief in those days was Sheol was this place that was out of sight where you were separated totally from God. And they, and they believed that this place, Sheol, was down in the depths of the ocean, and not just way down in the depths of the ocean, but, but it was somehow, whether it was an underwater cave or whatever, but it was underneath everything. You went down in the water, and then you went underneath into the bowels of the earth, and you were in Sheol, totally separated from God for eternity. That was their picture of being in hell, was a separation from God. And it says, and out of the belly of Sheol I cried. So, so this big fish, evidently Jonah knew that it was swimming around. It was going down and up and down and up. And he says, and you heard my voice for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. You kind of get this picture of being sloshed around in the stomach of a big old fish. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, the picture of Sheol, yet I will look again toward your whole yet. I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Kind of a, you know, it's kind of a gross picture of where he found himself. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. He went down to that place I just described to you. The earth was with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your temple those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. I listen to Jonah's prayer, and I hate to admit this to you, but it is my prayer, and I think it's all of our prayers. We walk in disobedience. We're in places we shouldn't be. We're doing things we should not do. And we get caught. And we get swallowed up in this thing. And we know that destruction is near. We find ourselves in, maybe it's not seaweed wrapped around our head, but maybe that would be a good thing. But we know that we know that we have gone too far. And then we cry out to the Lord. And what do we say? Lord, I'll do this and I'll do that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll serve you all the time, Lord. You, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll become a Sunday school teacher. I'll tithe. And we, we start with all, we start with all of the things that we're going to promise the Lord. I may have told you the story before. You know, I have an adrenaline problem, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out yet. When I got out of college, I had three children, little children. 
And I went to work for the National Hurricane Center down in Miami. And being the old military guy that I was and having always had the opportunity to be involved with projects that involved a whole lot of adrenaline, because I had degrees not only in meteorology but in computer science, and they were automating all of the reconnaissance hurricane reconnaissance aircraft and computerizing all the data collection, they offered me this incredible job to fly as the computer analyst on hurricane reconnaissance aircraft. And so for years, I flew into hurricanes for a living. You know, it's kind of an interesting work, by the way. You know, I get on a commercial plane, and we fly through a little bit of a cloud, and the plane goes like this, and people go, ooh, we're going to die. You have no idea what turbulence is like. <laughs> but I remember, I remember, I know how, jo I know how it works. I, I know exactly what Jonah did. We were flying a hurricane in 1973 off the coast of Bermuda. And when you fly hurricane reconnaissance, you just don't go out to locate the storm. What happens is the National Hurricane Research Laboratory asks us to collect data in a certain way. And on this particular flight, they had asked us to penetrate into Hurricane Ellen at 500 feet off the water. The reason for flying into that hurricane at 500 feet off the water is so that we could collect sea surface temperatures across the eye wall of the hurricane. Now, we were flying C-130s in those days, and we most of the C-130s that we flew, they were equipped with a chute that we could put this instrument in. It's called a disposable bathothermograph, and it's about this long. And what you do is you slide it into this chute, and you'd lock it in there, and then when it was time, you'd fire it out, and it would fire out of the bottom of the aircraft, and it had fins on it. And as soon as it broke three of the aircraft, the fins would come up, and this thing would fall fairly straight down. And then when it hit the water, as soon as it hit the water, those fins caused this antenna to pop up out of the top of it, and the temperature probe would go down into the water, and it would transmit to us back in the airplane the temperatures of the water. But the problem was that we were going to fly into this storm at 500 feet off the water, and this particular aircraft that we were flying that day wasn't equipped with a chute. And so we have a problem. How do you get these things out of the airplane? Well, I'm a computer systems analyst. Once we're in the middle of a hurricane, if the computers break, I can't do anything about it because it's too rough. You just, you're strapped in and you stay strapped in. So the only way we could get these things out of the aircraft was to open the door. And so guess who won the job? <laughs> so I remember, and again, you know, adrenaline, this, I thought, this, this is cool. This is cool. And so I put the, a parachute harness on. And we were in a 130, and if you're familiar with those planes, we were, uh, we were going to open the side door. And this cargo grommet's on the floor, and I had hooked myself to the floor so that when we opened the door, I wouldn't get bounced out of the plane. And, and, the, and all the instruments were there in front of me, and, and the pilot called me back, and he says, okay, John, you can open the door. And I remember opening the door and pulling it back and sliding it over, and for the first time, in all the years of flying in hurricanes, I saw the ocean surface from 500 feet in the air. And it was the strangest thing. It was black because there's no sunlight really penetrating down, so the water doesn't have a blue cover. And the wind is so strong that waves don't form. What happens is the waves, as they try to form, the wind just shears the top off of them, and it's this black gray foam. And I'm dropping these instruments out the door as we're flying through this storm. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, I have lost my mind. I have a wife and three small children back in Miami. What am I doing out here? And let me tell you, 
I made more promises to God that day than you can ever imagine. I might as well have been Jonah in the belly of that whale. Oh, Lord, when I get back, I'm going to give my life to you. I'm not going to play Christian anymore. I'm not going to just get my kids all gussied up to go to church on Sunday morning and walk down there and sleep during the pastor's message, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Oh, Lord, you've got to get me out of here. I can't believe I've agreed to do such a stupid thing. And, and I made all of those promises. And, and then, obviously, we survived. But we did some severe damage to that airplane. We had to fly it back to the manufacturer in Marietta, Georgia, and we told them what we did with the airplane. They looked at us and they said, you did what? <laughs> I remember getting home. Now I'm back on solid turf. Isn't it interesting that when you're in fear, the promises you'll make to God and then once he gets you out of it, how quickly you forget what you told him. Here's Jonah. He's saying, Lord, I'm, I know your mercies. I will sacrifice to you. I will sing with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay everything that I vowed. Lord, you are my salvation. Words from the belly of a whale. So the Lord spoke to the fish. I don't know how he did that. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, did you ever think of a grand entry? <laughs> I mean, you have your choice when it comes to obeying the Lord. It's like this. You can do what he says and arrive in a 747 or get puked out of a fish. You have your choice. But one way or the other, God will have his way. Do you, do you, you realize this. God will always have his way. And he takes Jonah, and now he vomits, the fish vomits him up on the beach, a beach that's close to Nineveh. Now, I mean... He got to where he was supposed to be, but I don't know what kind of shape he was in. Now, I heard all kinds of stories about, oh, you know, here comes Jonah. He gets thrown up on the beach. Imagine if you were sunning yourself on the beach one day, and all of a sudden you, you heard this noise and this not-so-pleasant sound, and you looked out, and here was this guy coming out of the water that had been in the belly of a whale for three weeks, uh, three days, and seaweed wrapped around his head, and his skin all bleached white, and his clothes rotted off, and everything else, and he... Yeah, yeah, I, 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 those descriptive pictures are interesting, but I don't think they're necessary because I got a feeling that there was something about Jonah that was different than when he got on that ship versus when he came out of that fish. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Oh, he changed. I mean, this was a life-changing experience for him. It, he didn't go now look for a fish that was going to take him in another direction. So he, 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 it says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. A three-day journey in extent. It was, a, it was a big city, and it was going to take Jonah days to walk through it. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I don't know, you know, what... Well, I suspect that his attitude wasn't good, because we're going to read in a moment that it had nothing to do with fear. Isn't this interesting? Jonah didn't stay away from Nineveh because he was afraid of dying. It had nothing to do with that. Look at what happens here. It says, 
And he began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, or do not let them eat or drink water. He says, Look, we're going to not only dress in sackcloth and ashes, but we're going to proclaim this fast. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to, the God, to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Folks, Jonah in his disobedience was the, 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 the one that God used to bring about the greatest revival that has ever been spoken of in the Bible. We see the city of Nineveh being broken. Now you would think that that would be something that Jonah would be overwhelmed with. It says, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil. Then God saw their, saw their works, that they turned away from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. He spared Nineveh. But look at the next verse. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Why? You see, you see, I, I think of this myself. Imagine starting at the freeway up off north of Fremont Street and walking the length of the strip telling the city of Las Vegas to repent of their ways and having the whole city go into a state of, 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 of repentance and have the mayor of this city throw all of his gin bottles away <laughs> and, 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 and start worshiping God and, and, then have, and you watch an entire city come to know Jesus why would you be angry? Well, look at Jonah. It says it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. Listen, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. <laughs> he was angry with God for forgiving them. Now that sounds absurd, doesn't it? Okay, you ready for a reality check? Have you ever had a problem with somebody that you disliked, that has harmed you in some great way? And the Lord says, I want you to pray for that person, and I want you to go to that person, and I want you to tell that person that I love them. Have you ever had this feeling in your spirit that says, I'm not going to do it. I don't want God to forgive them. As a matter of fact, I want God to crush them. 
I, 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 God, you don't understand. Do, do you know what this person did to me? And you want me to do what? I think it's more reality than we, we think of. I won't ask for a show of hands in this room, but I'd be willing to bet that we're in Las Vegas. We can use that term, bet. I have to be careful. I talk differently in Las Vegas than I do in other pulpits. You know, they don't subscribe to some of our vernacular. But, but, but have we ever... I would be willing to say that there's... Because I know human nature. I know it well enough to say to you that every one of us in this room has had at least one person that has hurt us desperately to the place where we, we almost cringe when we even think about that person. And yet I know we've forgiven them. I, I understand that principle. I, 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 have, I, I have those people. We all have them. I have forgiven them. But you know what? I'm not so sure I want God to. And I'm only being honest and transparent with you. See, when you get old enough, you can say whatever you want. And you can either think I'm just a crazy old man and that doesn't matter. But the bottom line is this very simply, that we, it, it, it's a tough situation for us because there are people that, we, that, that hurt us desperately and there's that part of us that we don't want. We don't want God to forgive them and bless them. And, and we don't want to be sitting back thinking and seeing them just being able to enjoy all of the blessings of God and he's pouring them out on them. And, and we realize, God, this person, this thing that they've done to me, taken me years to recover. I can't even, I can't even imagine anybody wanting to forgive someone that would provide so much pain. That's Jonah. He didn't want God to forgive Nineveh. God, don't you understand what these people have done? They've destroyed so many. They're the only people in recorded history that we know of that skinned people alive. They were a vicious, vicious people. And Jonah knew, if I go to those people and I ask them to repent and they do, God's going to forgive them and they don't deserve to be forgiven. One day, years ago, there was somebody that brought such pain into my life that I came that close to wanting to quit the ministry. And I remember driving along and seeing their car and all of these things welled up in me. And then I heard God say, why does that bother you? I have enough on you to send you to hell right now. Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that. But look at what happens. He says, therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He says, I knew you'd do this. I knew you'd do it. I knew you'd forgive him. Now kill me. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning drawn, as morning dawned the next day, 
God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Do you see what the Lord said? He says, Jonah, you're, you've got, your frame of reference is all wrong. You're concerned about a plant that one moment was here and then it was gone and it has so bothered you, yet you are angry with me for taking a group of people who don't know their right from their left that I might save them. It's a reality check for us. It's an incredible story about human beings and whether or not we trust that God knows best. And when he chooses to forgive, he's the one who forgives. We're going to come to the communion table right now. And I want to challenge you as we come to that table. Are we going to function as the reluctant missionary? Or are we going to be thankful that we serve a God that forgives because of how much he has forgiven us? So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the things that are given to us in your word. We, we thank you for the way that you can take such a simple story as this one of Jonah and show us so much about the behavior of who we are. Lord, the promises we make to you and we don't keep. The things that we choose on our own accord not to do because we don't want the outcome to be a certain way. Lord, forgive us of these things. Grow us in what you want us to grow in, that we might be everything that you want us to be, even when we don't like what we're asked to do. You are God. And we know that you will reward those that obey you. And so, Jesus, we want to be people of obedience. We thank you, Lord. We come to your table now. Minister to us. Before I have the ushers pass the elements, I want you to just keep your heads bowed for a moment. Let me mention two things to you. First, I don't want to be cavalier about this and just say that everybody in the room has been down this road because I'm not sure everybody has. But I know I have. And I think about it and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I do want you to forgive them. And Lord, if you choose to prosper them, then you are God and I am not. If there's something that has been hanging in your life, don't be the reluctant missionary that Jonah was. Just give it to the Lord tonight. I'm not saying there's a big fish out there ready to swallow you, but boy, 
There are times you feel like you've been swallowed by one. The second thing is rather simple, but oh so important. What I shared tonight was for, for the believer, but yet by chance if you're here tonight and you've never given your heart to the Lord, before we come to this table, let us understand this. The story of Jonah, yes, it's certainly appealing to those who know the Lord, but yet there's things in here that I know that God wants people to hear. Believer or not, his word will never return void. You're not here by accident, but if God has brought you here for the sole purpose of hearing just one thing that was said tonight, know that it was by divine appointment. And my challenge to you is for you to know that this God, that you might even question whether he exists or not, has been faithful to bring you here so that you might hear these things. Are you ready to say, Jesus, I trust you. Now that might take a little while for that trust to go, but it has to start to grow, but it has to start somewhere. Are you willing to say tonight, Lord, I want to say to you, I'm tired of trying to fix my life my way. I'm giving it to you. Yes, I've sinned against you, but you promised to forgive me and make me new. And I'm trusting you for that. Is that you? If it is, before we go any further, before we come to his table, let me do something with you. Right where you're sitting, I want to pray with you. Everyone's head is bowed. Are you ready to say, Jesus, I'm yours? If that's you, just raise your hand. Let me pray for you right now. Before we go any further, anyone at all, you just get that hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I am ready. God bless you over there. That is so cool. Anyone else? Anyone else? You just get that hand up. It's dark out there. I want to be able to see it. God bless you. That is so neat. Anyone else? You just get it up high enough for me to see it. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, you can put your hands down. I see you over here. Praise God. For those of you that just raise your hands, I want to pray a simple prayer, and I want you to pray along with me. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth that he is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Tonight, salvation is for you. So pray with me. I'll pray slowly. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. I'm tired of trying to fix my life my way. I need you. Yes, Lord, I've sinned against you. But you promised you'd forgive me. And not only that, you said you'd take that sin away. I don't know how you're going to do that. But I know one thing for certain. You said you would. And I know you will. Because I know you can. Because you're the Lord. Thank you for saving me. Fill me with your spirit and make me strong. I don't want to go back to my old way of life ever again. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for these that have just raised their hands and given their heart to you. Lord, I pray tonight as we come to this table now, as they come, as part of the family, that you so touch them and allow them to know what it is that has happened, that this confession is real, and they will now start walking with you. Lord Jesus, bless this time now. We love you, Lord.